Welcome to the Scottish Rite Journal podcast, an audio presentation of the Scottish Rite Journal, brought to you by the Supreme Council of the Scottish Rite, Southern Jurisdiction, Mother Supreme Council of the World. This week's article is The Albert Pike Death Hoax by Maynard Edwards, 32nd degree, KCCH, and comes from the May-June 2020 issue of the Scottish Rite Journal. In this era of social media, we have all heard the cries of fake news apply to one story or another. While these are often political in nature, there has also been a sizable increase in false reports of celebrities meeting an untimely death. From pop stars to famous actors, celebrities are falsely reported dead online, either as a prank or as a simple mistake, and within a few hours they are restored to life by a simple tweet or Facebook posting. Yet celebrity death hoaxes are hardly a new phenomenon. American writer and humorist Mason Mark Twain was reported dead in 1897 after taking seriously ill while he was in London. Upon hearing the news of his own death, a full decade before his actual death, Brother Twain famously quipped, The report of my death is greatly exaggerated. Most baby boomers will similarly remember the Paul is Dead hoax of the late 1960s, yet Paul McCartney, erstwhile bassist of the Beatles, is still very much alive to this day. The series of coded messages supposedly found in Beatles music and album art to the contrary. Of the many celebrity death hoaxes, however, few have lasted as long or ended so strangely as that surrounding Albert Pike, beginning in 1858, a full 33 years before his actual death. The number 33 is happenstance, despite any conspiratorial allusions to the contrary. Long thought to be the work of one of Pike's legal or political detractors, the true tale of Pike's death hoax is much simpler, but provides an excellent lesson for all Freemasons. On October 28, 1858, Colonel Albert Pickett of Alabama died of a kidney ailment. Pickett was a lawyer, author, and well-known Alabama historian. The Montgomery Confederation newspaper reported Pickett's death on November 1st with a short, single-line obituary later carried by several other Alabama newspapers. In those days, the telegraph wire services were in operation but had not been widely adopted. Newspapers, especially small-town newspapers, relied on what were called exchanges. Quite literally, they would exchange papers with neighboring towns to gather news from beyond their own reach. On November 10, 1858, the weekly Mississippian newspaper in Jackson, Mississippi, published a single-line report of Colonel Albert Pickett's death, with one small but critical error. Our Alabama exchanges record the death of Colonel Albert Pike, historian of that state. This simple, and likely accidental, transposition of last names caused other papers to take notice. Pike, being of greater renown than Pickett, became the focus of obituaries all across the South, as the exchanges traveled from town to town, each paper adding its own line or two to Colonel Pike's accolades, thus contributing to the report's apparent legitimacy. When news reached the Nashville Republican banner, however, the editors recognized the story was a likely mistake. On December 16, 1858, the banner published the news, but with skepticism. We hope and believe there is some mistake here. The death of so distinguished a man as Albert Pike would scarcely pass with so modest a notice. Less than two weeks later, on December 28, 1858, the Republican banner pronounced that they had located Albert Pike, alive and well, and just back from a long buffalo hunting trip he had undertaken after representing the Creek Indian tribe in a claim against the federal government. Though Albert Pike was now known to be alive by newspaper readers in Nashville, news of his death was still spreading across the country. The story broke in Washington, D.C., just days after Christmas, 1858. The first week of January 1859, Pike's untimely death was the focus of conversation at the Washington, D.C. gathering known as the Roast Oyster Club, a club Pike had helped start only a year earlier. While enjoying dinner, club members enthusiastically shared stories and remembrances of their dearly departed friend, Albert Pike. Sometime in the middle of dinner, the door opened, and to the astonishment of every man present, there stood Albert Pike, alive and well. The crowd expressed relief to see their friend on the proper side of the grass, and celebration and conversation followed into the night. The next day, Albert Pike ran into his friend John Coyle, editor of the National Intelligencer, a Washington, D.C. weekly paper. Coyle, 
who had been preparing an obituary for Pike, was dumbstruck at seeing the supposedly dead Pike walking about as healthy as could be. According to Pike's own account of the chance meeting with Coyle, once he was able to speak, he said, What right have you to be walking around for all the world like a live man when you're dead? To which I responded, Because I have not been waked. Until then, how could I keep quiet in the grave? Then and there, Coyle committed to giving Pike a lavish wake, despite Pike being quite far from death's door. A few days later, in January of 1859, over 150 guests came to Pike's so-called life wake at John Coyle's home. It was an extravagant affair, with printed programs and 13 of Albert Pike's closest friends being named as the mourners-in-chief to Corpus Albertus Magnus, Albert the Great, with prominent Washington attorney George Gideon presiding as the superintendent of ceremonies. The atmosphere was nothing short of celebratory, as guests enjoyed a feast and a quantity of wine and spirits, which one guest reported as being measured in gallons. Eulogies to Pike were delivered by some of Washington's most distinguished citizens, and the host, John Coyle, sang several songs to Pike. One such song was a parody of Pike's own poem, The Fine Arkansas's Gentleman. The parody included the verses. The Masons and Oddfellows prepare to celebrate. His obsequies with every form of grief appropriate. So sad the tavern keepers and the faro dealers feel, they draped a bell a half an hour, an intermit a deal. This fine Arkansas's gentleman, who died before his time. But Johnny Coyle, an Irishman, the news refused to take. He swore no gentleman alive should cheat him of his wake. So he called his friends together, as here you plainly see, and he has set out spirits and the tobacco jar to lay the body under the table decently. This fine Arkansas's gentleman, who died before his time. Not to be outdone, Pike had prepared a song of his own, which was sung by his friend Jack Savage. The song called One Spree at Johnny Coyle's tells of Pike's adventures in the underworld while he was supposedly dead and his bid to return to the living for one last party at his old friend's house. A gentleman from Arkansas, not long ago, Tis said, waked up one pleasant morning and discovered he was dead. He was on his way to Washington, not seeking for the spoils, but rejoicing in the promise of a spree at Johnny Coyle's. Midway through the evening, Albert Pike was called upon to speak. Surprising the now jovial crowd, Pike took a somber tone as he read his prepared remarks, at first mentioning that he had tried and failed to approach the subject with humor. Yet the kind words of so many respected friends had moved him so profoundly that he was struck humble by the entire affair. I have found men more generous than I believed, since far more good has been said of me than I deserve, while much ill that might have truly been uttered has been kindly left unsaid. Life in my eyes has assumed a new value, and the world is brighter than it seemed before. Soon enough, Toasting and singing recommenced and continued well into the small hours of the morning. The entire affair had been such a high point in Washington society that all of the articles, eulogies, and writings regarding the event were bound together and titled The Life Wake of the Fine Arkansas Gentleman. The volume was printed privately and distributed to many of those who had attended the event, and a copy is kept in the archives of the Supreme Council at the House of the Temple in Washington, D.C. Though news spread quickly throughout Washington, D.C., Tennessee, and Arkansas that Albert Pike was indeed amongst the living, news of his alleged death was still being circulated in the South until late January 1859. By early spring, however, most papers had printed retractions, and many made mention of the fact that Albert Pike had showed up at his own wake. As Masons, we are taught to keep a tongue of good report, meaning, in part at least, that we should always be mindful of our words, yet we must also be mindful and careful when sharing information of which we are unsure, especially in our current era of lightning speed communication. Simple mistakes can ripple across social media in an instant. It was likely a mere typesetting error, after all, which led to the great sovereign grand commander of the Scottish Rite, Southern Jurisdiction, being reported as dead three decades prematurely. There was no malice intended anywhere. But for more than four months' time, the great Albert Pike was supposed dead. Each paper that printed the obituary, save one, made no effort to verify the story. 
simply passing it on as truth without question. Though it had a harmless and humorous conclusion, we would do well to remember the tale of the fine Arkansas gentleman who showed up at his own wake. It demonstrates that a single mistaken word or the repeating of unverified information, intentionally or accidentally, can have far-reaching consequences. As an added feature to this Scottish Right Journal podcast, I had the privilege to speak with Brother Maynard regarding his article. Hope you enjoy it. Uh, because of the amount of time it took for all that news to travel, were there any, any organizations, people, individuals, whatever, that were trying to cash in on Brother Pike's quote-unquote death? There were no organizations trying to cash in on Pike's death. It was really just an unfortunate confluence of, of typos, more or less. In, in the old days, newspapers would basically travel from town to town, and they would, so as a, for instance, you know, let's say you're in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. There's a local newspaper there reports the local news. Well, that goes out to all the folks in the town, but then they also send that newspaper to towns like Baltimore or to Philadelphia or other places. And telegraphs were just getting started. So you're starting to see the beginning of wire services and wire reporting and things like this. Generally speaking, it's still traveling on horseback from one town to another. And when they get the news, they repeat it. So if a story happens in a town like Gettysburg and then it makes its way down to Baltimore mm -hmm. the next day, okay, well then a couple days later, then it's going to make its way to Philadelphia and Washington and wherever those newspapers go. And it's sort of, you know, almost like an old phone tree where one call leads to this call, leads to this call, leads to this call. And so that's why it takes a little time to travel. I don't think there was an opportunity to make any cash on it. Nobody was making any bucks off of selling, you know, Pike memorabilia or anything of that sort. It was just one of those things where some guy wrote down that Albert, uh, that this brother from, or that this guy from uh, Alabama had died and then Alabama accidentally got changed to Arkansas. Mm -hmm. And then Al Albert, whomever got changed to Albert Pike. And next thing you know, Albert Pike of Arkansas is dead because it's traveled three towns over. And that's what the story kind of found was which papers did that and how exactly it happened. Because we knew since it happened, we knew that there was this death hoax about Pike. But the question was, was it deliberate or was this just a dumb mistake? And it turns right. out it was just a dumb mistake. Crazy how much a dumb mistake can, can oh, yeah, so many things. It happens faster today, but also gets corrected faster today. So, well, yeah. you know, as we record this, it's October. A month ago, we all got the news that Tony Dow, who was Wally from Leave it to Beaver, had died. Right. And, you know, about six hours later, we get the news that, no, he's not dead. And... And then the next day, he actually did pass away. And it so these things happen quickly. I mean, that news spread across the country like wildfire. You know, people yeah. broke into newscasts. Oh, Tony Dow, actor Tony Dow has died. And it's unfortunate that it occurs, but mistakes happen. And um, it's, it's much faster to correct now. But back in Pike's day, you know, the folks that printed the story in – Alabama, where the original guy died, they would have no way of knowing that their story is what led to it happening. It, they yeah. wouldn't have known. I mean, they would have just gotten the news. All oh, Pike died too. There's no way to realize that that that, that had happened. So, uh, at least now in today's world, it moves faster, but we can correct it faster as well. Uh, what was what was Pike's family's reaction to it? Was there any attempt on their part to try and correct the mistake, or was it all on him to try to figure out? I don't think they knew. I don't think they realized it. I, I don't think anybody in Pike's, you know, near Earth orbit, so to speak, realized what was going on. I mean, it took place over a period of, if I'm not mistaken, I think it happened um, basically from the fall into the winter. And I think most of that time, Pike was out west hunting buffalo with some Native American tribes. He was a he was a big buffalo hunter and was a huge advocate for Native American rights and represented. Uh, several Native American tribes before the United States Supreme Court, which is why he ended up with a big statue over in Legislator Square that's since been torn down. But he, it, it was his work with the Native Americans that, you know, he had such an affinity for them and was accepted by them that he would often be gone for months at a time just to go out buffalo hunting. And he was, that's what happened. This occurred while he was away. So nobody could get in touch with him. Mm -hmm. And I don't think anybody tried real hard to get in touch with him either. So I don't think they really even realized it. So nobody really tried to correct it. 
until Pike showed up in Washington, D.C., having concluded his buffalo hunt, you know, steps off the train and then he like, you know, somebody sees him and says, aren't you supposed to be dead? Right. I can't imagine how that must feel getting that question. Uh, who were some, were there any other notable people in attendance at his wake or, or was it just reserved for Masons only? No, it was not Masons only at all. In fact, it wasn't even mostly Masons. Mostly it was, um, and this was before, I believe either before, or it, it was probably right before Pike became Grand Commander. So he was, he'd already written some of the ritual and I think he'd already done the magnum opus and, uh, and those kinds of things. So he, he was definitely a part of the Masonic world, if you will. But most of the people that were attending his wake and his funeral were the who's who of Washington, D.C. at the time. I mean, Mm -hmm. newspaper editors, especially, because there were several newspapers in Washington, D.C. at the time, Um, you know, senators, congressmen. So, you know, Pike was a very well-known figure, a very well-known character because of his legal work. And so he he was definitely... um, being eulogized by a lot of uh, Washington insiders for using air quotes. So it wasn't only Masons. It was not mostly Masons. It was mostly just regular folks of Washington, D.C. And so that kind of leads into that leads in perfectly to to this question, I think. Um, He seemed from reading the article, he seemed pretty surprised how he was received by his friends in some of the speeches at at his wake. I mean, did he have a less than stellar reputation outside of the Scottish Rite or D.C.? Or was he just, or was he just overwhelmed by the how they felt? You know, I think he was just overwhelmed by how he felt. I, I mean, could you imagine what when people are when someone passes away, it is in our nature as human beings to forgive their transgressions, whatever they might be, and to focus on on the good parts of someone. And so, I think each of us would be overwhelmed by what our friends might say if we were gone. So. While it was a little crazy and a little strange that Pike got to attend his own eulogy, I mean, when you think about it, as the people were preparing, they really did believe he was gone. Yeah. So yeah. the words that they were they were writing down, the songs they had prepared and things like that, those were filled with legitimate emotions. I mean, if we were to, as a goof, have a wake for Matt Bowers right now, I would write something you know, a little tongue in cheek, knowing you were sitting there, knowing you're still breathing and hearing all of this. So, yeah, for sure. but, you know, if a friend or, or someone had actually passed, you know, the, the emotion is going to be very different and very uh, genuine. And I think that he got to hear that, which is not something most people get to hear. And I believe that was why he was so overwhelmed and so touched. I mean, no one was saying anything negative and he's getting to hear how people genuinely feel when they let go of all, you know, of anger or of upset or right. of insult or whatever negativity they're carrying. When someone passes away, you just, it's in our nature to let that go. And Pike, I think, got to hear what that sounds like. And that's, uh, that's, that's got to be overwhelming for anyone. Also in the article, the, the, it read that the news spread, it seemed to focus more on it spreading through the South. Was there any particular reason for that? Well, I think Pike was, um, uh, and certainly in Arkansas and and the surrounding states, he was more well-known. Um, he was definitely, you know, he was born in Boston, but he was definitely a Southerner. I think that just he was more famous in that part of the world. Mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm trying to think of a, of a modern analogy. You know, uh, the Paul Revere and the Raiders version of Louis Louis is more famous in the Pacific Northwest than the Kingsman's version, which was famous everywhere else. So I, I think that, and in particular, geography at that point in time limited uh, your acclaim because, you know, nowadays it's famous to be, it, it's easy to be famous worldwide. You just go on YouTube and boom, the whole world yeah. can see it. You, you couldn't do that back then. So you were limited to the areas in which you could physically travel in a short period of time. So Pike's acclaim was more renowned in those areas than it was certainly in the North. Uh, And I I just think it's just a, a matter of the time and of the geography. Like and share this article. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel. If you wish to comment, please leave one. And as a reminder, hit the notifications bell. Any accompanying photographs or citations for this article can be found in the corresponding print edition. The Scottish Rite Journal is published by the Supreme Council of the Scottish Rite 
Southern Jurisdiction, Mother Supreme Council of the World. Mark Dreisenstock, 32nd Degree, KCCH, Managing Editor. I'm your host, Matt Bowers.